Well, here we are again, uh, celebrating an amazing week in Jesus' life together again. And this is Thursday night. This is the time when he had his final time together with his disciples. And that time with them centered around the Passover celebration. And it was a celebration. Remember, we talked a few weeks ago about the whole history of that. And it was an amazing thing that God miraculously, through the 10 miraculous plagues, delivered the people. And so every year they were supposed to remember that. And as we said before, they had failed to do that. And so they were very careful about it in Jesus' time. So what this will be ultimately, however, is the last Passover that's truly celebrating looking back to that time when they escaped um, Egypt. Now, as we look back, we see the Passover as something that's us escaping the burden of sin and its uh, effect on us. But what I want to do at first here is just go back and take a look at what it was like in his time. Remember, this is the picture that we put up before that was describing the Passover lamb's blood that was used to cause the death angel to pass over them. And they looked back on that and they celebrated it, but now Jesus is going to bring new meaning to that. So we're going to start really with what they did in advance preparation when they were setting up to do the, the uh, Passover meal. Now, four days before they would select the lamb. It would give them time to see if the lamb was well, to see if the lamb was fit, and all of that. And so they always chose the, the lamb four days before, which just happened to be the same day for this particular Passover that Jesus would have been doing that triumphal entry that we talked about last week. And then the day before, they were to find and remove any leaven in the home. And it was done in kind of a ritual. In some ways, they would take it to someone else and then bring it back afterwards. But there was to be no leaven. Notice what it says in Exodus 12, 15, as they were getting ready to actually leave Egypt. It said, for seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. And on the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. So there were really significant consequences to not following this tradition. And so the day before, they would have, they would even search the whole home, and it was done as kind of a ritual to search and to remove all leaven. Now, the day of the meal. And remember, uh, Jesus sent the disciples, and he said, go prepare the Passover. This is what they would have been doing as they were preparing the Passover. And the very first thing they would have been doing is setting up how everyone was going to lie. They would do this in reclining with a, a table that was maybe 18 inches off the ground and a bunch of pillows, and they would have assigned seats. And the seats would go from the most prominent person and, of course, the host of the feast would have been Jesus, and then everyone else would have been in, arranged around that. Which, interestingly, when you go back and you read the account, it's kind of humorous because they start arguing over who's the greatest. And my guess is that these seat assignments probably had something to do with that because two of them made up the seat assignments. Then when they any, arrived, not only at, on the day of the Passover, but any time, you should, when you went into someone's home, have a foot washing, and typically the host would have their lowest servant do that. Well, again, who's the host of this meal? Jesus. But he takes on that responsibility himself. And that's something incredible about the humility of Jesus and the change in the kingdom mentality about leadership, about leaders being servants, not being served by others. And then... As soon as they sat at the table, they would have a hand washing. Then, after that, the meal itself would begin, and it was based on Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. This was the heart of the ritual that took place. And we're only going to hit upon a little bit of this, because these four cups, which obviously are not first century cups, would have represented the four verbal statements that are made here in this passage. And notice it says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out 
from under the yoke of the Egyptians, that first phrase, I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, and I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So each time that they celebrated the Passover, they went through these four commands that were marked off by the drinking of a cup of wine that would have been shared um, and celebrating these things. So you're going to see these, and we'll break it up by each of those. So the four ritual cups of wine, the first one was with bitter herbs, and it said, I will bring you out. And the bitter herbs were to remind them of how bad they had it when they were under the slave, slavery of the Egyptians. Because remember, while they wandered in the wilderness, some people kept saying, hey, this isn't so bad, let's go back. But the Passover was meant to remind them of just how bad they had it when they were there. And God's promise, I will bring you out. And then they would remember, he did bring us out. He parted the Red Sea. And we are free people now because God kept that promise. And so that would be the first cup. Mind if I drink? Now, the second cup, there would be another hand washing, and then the breaking of bread, which would be unleavened bread, of course, and the eating of the meal, which would include a lamb and other food. And then they would sing the Hallel songs of Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. Sometimes the host would sing it, Sometimes someone else would sing it. Sometimes they would all sing it together. It would be done differently in different homes. But these two psalms were the ones. And the second cup is celebrating that promise, I will deliver you. The third cup was, I will redeem you. I will buy you back. You have been owned by the Egyptians, but now you will belong to me. The last of the unleavened bread wafers are eaten and they celebrate this. Now, in each of these cups, as they're going along, oh, I forgot one, didn't I? Okay. Now, the third one was, I will redeem you. And each of these had more rituals underneath, and I'm not going through the whole Seder meal here. It would take probably an hour and a half to two hours for us to do that. And, but the third cup was, I will redeem you. And then the fourth cup, of course, here's the third. The fourth cup is, I will take you as my people. You become special to me. And at the end of all that, they remember it said at the end of the supper, it said they went out after they sung a hymn, they went out and left the place. And the songs that they would have been singing would have been Psalms 115 through 118 when Jesus did that. Now, this isn't exactly what you experience when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, is it? Ours is completely different. In fact, Jesus redefined the whole symbology of this. His suffering is symbolized by the bitter herbs instead of the suffering of slavery. And the wine is his shed blood that is the price that's paid to make us belong to him instead of belonging to the slavery to sin that we talked about a couple weeks ago. And his body, symbolized by the unleavened bread, is what is broken for us. That we literally become his body. We become his people, representing him. Now we're going to have a video for a couple of minutes that I think will be helpful. Uh, I want you to kind of think and reflect on it. And think about what it is that Christ has done for us and the price that he paid for us. So watch this, if you would.
And now what I'd like us to do, and I know this is strangely awkward for all of us, but as you have reflected on what Christ has done for us, now I would hope that you'll have the elements with you of some form of juice or water that you can use to symbolize the cups that we talked about a moment ago, but more importantly, to symbolize what we talk about every time that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so we'll start by celebrating with the bread. And the bread, Jesus said, this is my body. It is his body broken for us. And when we do this, we're remembering that Jesus was willing to be broken, to purchase us, to call us his own. And we are now the body of Christ. And so I want to encourage you all to eat and remember the body of Christ. When that supper was ended, we know that Jesus took a cup, and it probably was that fourth cup. And he said, this is a cup of my blood. No longer was it looking back on the Passover lamb. It was looking on the ultimate Passover lamb, Jesus, who became the lamb of God for us. And he said, when you drink this cup, remember me. And now, as we think about that Lamb of God, Dee is going to sing us a song that will just send that message home to us. Oh, God. 
I want to thank you for joining us tonight. As awkward as that might seem to you, what a blessing it is to celebrate this week, even, even though we can't gather to do it, to celebrate this week as the body of Christ, ones purchased by him, to serve him, to love him, and to return to him the loyalty that he gave to us. As challenging as this time is, remember, he is with us, and he loves us enough to die for us. I think of the Psalm 139 where it says, every day for us was written in your book before one of them came to be. So if you're struggling, if you're anxious, just know that the one who is willing to go to the cross for us has us in his heart and his mind, and he will bring good out of this. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for sending your son, for being willing to subject him to the crucifixion because your heart would not allow you to be estranged from those you've chosen. And Heavenly Father, thank you for his willing sacrifice that he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done when he prayed and sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. We thank you for his example of loving obedience and putting others above himself. God, I pray that we would go from these in our homes and the places where you send us, and that we would carry that kind of love to others. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us.